The creators at Grounded believe that brewing great coffee shouldn't be a shot in the dark, and we couldn't agree more. Use the coupon code The Coffee Podcast for 10% off Grounded at groundedcoffeebook.com. Our friends at Map It Forward are hosting two events we think you might be interested in how to map a successful career as a barista, and how to map a successful career in business as a coffee roaster. Use the coupon code The Coffee Podcast for 10% off your ticket. Remember, you can attend virtually. The following conversation is a living continuum that includes every link of the coffee value chain from before the seed to after the cup. I'm Jesse Hartman, and this is The Coffee Podcast. I present to you the first episode of our coffee roasting series, a focus on the history of coffee roasting itself, with none other than the coffee historian himself, Professor Jonathan Morris. So we're we're here to talk about roasting, and yep. um, before we do, I think it's it's appropriate to define some terms because uh, you know terms get really confusing uh, yep. because they get used in so many different ways. So let's do that first. You know, when I say specialty coffee, I might be saying something different than uh, you are when you say specialty coffee in historical terms. Can you define specialty coffee for us so we can streamline understanding for our topic on roasting? Okay, so uh, as a historian, you probably would expect me to say this, but of course, the meaning of specialty coffee has changed quite a lot. So I would say now, um, well, I would say let's, let's follow the evolution When we first started talking about specialty coffee, really we're talking about anything that deviated at that time in the sort of uh, 70s onwards that deviated from the standard sort of bog standard blends and cafe kind of, you know, uh, cup of joe, as it were. We would be including at that point in the label anything espresso, anything espresso based, Mm -hmm. anything that had really any kind of origin, so country of origin information or general kind of information per se about it uh, and even things we would often see things like flavored coffee put up there because the people who were breaking if you like the idea of coffee as being more than just a very basic commodity that's where they had to start because the specialty coffee was going through the kind of you know the kind of um, what we would call delicatessen I guess what you would call at the time fancy stores and okay. me, and it's quite obvious to me that the meaning kind of shifted around. So by the time, for example, we first talk, talk, talk about specialty coffee in Europe, uh, certainly in the UK, that came over with that sort of coffee shop, sort of second wave Starbuck type stuff. And uh, really, people thought specialty coffee equals uh, espresso beverages. Hmm. Now, of course, we've kind of moved on from that again. And we're really talking about origin. And, it, you know, we're talking about origin. We're talking... I think now for specialty coffee, okay, so we've gone from the, does it taste distinctive in the cup, which is a great, if I may say so, early definition, because exactly distinguish that, you know, it's something different Mm -hmm. from what's normal, to now a position where, you know, yeah, we could be talking about scoring above 80, which um, if you are entirely happy with those things works well, uh, which would certainly be about having a special origin or being a blend that is blended to highlight particular characteristics. So I think there are some great specialty blends in espresso, but I actually know what's in those blends now and what they're trying to do. So for me, specialty has become more and more refined as a concept. And nowadays, I think you and I would not, for example, say our bog standard espresso or cafe latte with specialty coffee. Right. And to try and keep that in perspective when I'm writing now, I tend to distinguish between gourmet coffee which I think includes all of those, those gourmet uh-huh. beverages. Yeah. And specialty coffee, which as we know is something something else. Uh, Jonathan, can you walk us through the history of coffee roasting and highlight the major points in the global timeline? If we take, I suppose, first of all, would be the kind of the evolution. I have a, I have a theory in the book. And again, this is, hey, this is an exclusive for you, Jesse, because it's the first time I've talked about it in this way. Oh, but I nice. kind of try and put some eras into coffee. And so the first era that I see would be the kind of era, which is the kind of almost self-contained era of, if you like, when coffee is in circulation in the Islamic world around from the sort of, you know, coming from the Red Sea area, going out as far up as sort of into the, the passage up Arabia and eventually arriving in Turkey, but also 
we forget to say the passage the other way out to the Indias and uh, so forth. So around that whole diaspora there. And in most of that time, okay, so we start off from the principle that people are by and large roasting their own coffee. What they're getting is green coffee being shipped. Um, in fact, probably what they're getting is not even green coffee as we would recognize it, but as you know, progressively moves from being effectively um, bits of coffee, plant, fruit, et cetera, through okay. to being hulled coffee, uh, through to being sort of coffee husk, and mm -hmm. then sort of gradually coming to the point where we get to, to, to green. But in terms of the roasting, most of that's being done really on some kind of pan over a fire. Uh, and it gradually develops because if we think about Arabian coffee, which is the first coffee that we really know about in terms of coffee as opposed to what may have been, doing, uh, been going on in, in Ethiopia, then there it's very much sort of lightly roasted. Uh, toasted might be a better way of putting it. So it's into the pan, quick toast, uh, and then you you know ground and used in, in the in the coffee pot and that's really why if you if you kind of look at Arabian style coffee it's still you know very light very sort of um, light lightish brown almost translucent in color mm, okay. um, and so it's a, you know that's our kind of early roasting now gradually as coffee moves up the Arabian Peninsula it becomes a bit darker. And by the time it reaches uh, the Ottoman capital um, of Constantinople, so uh, just to kind of to, to sketch this very briefly, I suppose, you know, we're talking about the sort of the, the first half of the 1500s. Okay. Um, and by that point, it's clear that by the time we get to Turkey, they're roasting coffee. So they're no longer, uh, you know, just toasting it, but really roasting it, blackening it basically. So um, there's this whole thing, um, it's often quoted this poem about, you know, coffee is the kind of, um, uh, let's see if I can get it right. Uh, effectively, it's described as the, as the kind of the Negro beverage of, of love. Mm -hmm. And um, it's sort of, you know, that darkness. And again, if you think about what we see with, even with Turkish coffee today, again, that very heavy roast. So what we're doing is really, as you know, as a principle of roasting, you know, the principle moves from tasting the beans to tasting the roast. And certainly with that period, probably we're talking about tasting the roast. So we're now roasting, still using the pan, but really roasting in that pan rather than just toasting in the pan. So blackening the beans, making them well black before we then crush them. Gotcha. Um, and we even see in some of like the uh, the palaces of the sort of the rulers of Turkey and the sort of the wealthy, you would see an almost dedicated fireplace. So a place with a, with quite an elevated so there's plenty of room in which coffee specifically the coffee roasting would be done. So um, some of those sort of famous palaces will actually have kind of a whole room, which would be an entertaining room. But at the centre of it is quite a large, large sort of fireplace uh, with lots of setting back into it, so that this would be where the coffee was roasted, and then the various sort of steps. I see. So it, it it sounds like it was like a delicacy, like a like a luxury. Uh, yeah, sort of experience. yeah, very okay. much so. Uh, undoubtedly, that was that was a luxury, uh, and one of the sort of one of the things that goes throughout coffee's history really is that people who can have coffee and afford it as a luxury are very upset when people who are slightly less well off start using coffee or accessing it. And so huh. one of the things that we notice about coffee is sort of there are throughout, I would say, you know, all the studies that I do, there's always people lamenting that people are people who aren't really um, capable of appreciating coffee or somehow getting hold of it. Interesting. Uh, okay. And in fact, in truth, they're probably not. They're getting hold of, of various sort of um, admixes of coffee. But it, but it's kind of interesting that we have this sort of double, double sided face of, of coffee in one sense. You know, it's a very democratic drink and there's a lot of democratic culture around it. And yet people are very keen to, to keep it in the sort of, you know, the, the, um, the right circles for want of a better word. Interesting. Huh. Coffee, as we know, goes into Europe 
really from the, well, the first sort of recording of coffee is in Italy in sort of uh, 1575. So let's say the early 1600s. And then so the coffee houses really start in about the 1650s. And again, at that point, the roasting there is still being done on site. Usually, Occasionally, though, we are beginning to see now roasted coffee powder being sold by sort of kind of peddlers, people in markets and so forth. So you you know what that coffee would have tasted like i suspect very bad um <laughs> right. but we kind of so we're sort of seeing those sort of you know the first sort of steps of sometimes of actually giving people pre-roasted coffee however again i'd say that you know the majority of it is still coffee that um is actually roasted on or close to the point of consumption um and that goes on with the development to some extent of more sophisticated roasting devices for the home in the 18th century, which also then begins to be um, sort of taken up. So things like closing, as it were, sort of in, instead of just having an open pan, having a closed pan, having a paddle within that pan. So you kind of turn a handle that will paddle the beans around as you're trying to roast them. Okay. So you can see that this is all we're driving towards the idea of trying to get greater uniformity yeah, in the roast. Mm -hmm. In the 19th century is when I guess this technology, as I see it, begins to take off. And there are sort of two things. First of all, it's again at the household level still, but we're getting more sophisticated. So as again, coffee uh, actually spreads a little bit further down the households. Uh, so we're seeing coffee um, sort of roasters that are um, a little bit with um, rotational roasters. And, you know, then we get the, sort of the flange inside the roaster. So, mm. the, uh, so we're sort of still turning it by hand, but we've got flanges, so we're really making the beans go round now. We're beginning to have perhaps a sort of a proper heat source under the roaster rather than putting whatever we're using to roast on a fire. So we're doing that in home roasting and home roasting and also street roasting, which is which is quite common, is really where where we're at until towards the end of the 19th century. And then things really begin to take off because effectively what you get at that time is the start of companies making machinery for roasting. Okay. And of making machinery, therefore, that creates the possibility also that all the possibilities beginning to exist of doing a coffee business rather than up to that time what has existed, which is doing a grocery business, which sells a bit of coffee. What else is happening on a global scale to even make this possible for these manufacturer uh, companies to start building uh, coffee machinery? It's got to be a major steps in uh, human history, right? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think there's the, the, you know, there are some big picture technology things there where we're getting more into machine technology and more into, uh, if you like, thinking industrially. I see. Uh, and the big thing from coffee perspective is, of course, that from mid-century onwards, we're getting a lot more coffee on the market, specifically from mid-19th century. So from the 1850s, the rise of Brazil and the rise of Brazil is um, symbiotically linked, if you like, to the rise of the U.S. as a consumer market. So nice. as the U.S. goes through that big explosion of, of um, population in the later 19th century, um, the emigrants arriving from Europe and so forth, so Brazil is basically able to expand its coffee production and ship more coffee into the US. I see. So what really drives, so I was talking about sort of stages of coffee. So for me, you know, the first era is that, uh, that Islamic era. The second era is a kind of European colonial era. And then you have this third era, and that's the kind of industrial era that opens up with the US and Brazil coming to those dominant positions and really driving the development of the coffee industry. I see. And, and hence the development of this more manufactured roasting, taking it away from the home. Yeah, exactly right. And that starts in, um, so it's important to say, you know, that starts really in the cities in America, um, but also with the ability to then begin to look at the sort of the stage that goes on that, which is, of course, packaging your coffee, hmm. right? Because to have a roasting company of any size, to be able to do roasting as a business you need to be able to package your coffee and you need to 
um, you need okay. to then have a kind of, you know, a sense of a sufficient market and a way into that market to do it. So if we think about the first big coffee roasting firm, so uh, Arbuckles would be probably the first one one would think of, um, to some extent followed by sort of um, early Folgers. What these guys are doing is packaging their coffee. So uh, Arbuckles produces sort of coffee packs where, you know, the, the, the beans are sort of sealed, are roasted and sealed in um, really a sort of a paper package. But then that is supposedly guaranteed. It's kind of a lined paper package that is supposedly therefore guaranteed to keep the product fresh for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. And they supply that. Um, most famously with, with Arbuckles and Ariosa start supplying that to particularly um, the far west, actually. So people both trekking to the west, but also to sort of people out in the west so that it uh, becomes the kind of, you know, coffee that you can then buy and take to your homestead. Because previously what you do is buy a bulk of green coffee and mm -hmm. take it out to your homestead. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting to me. Um, I could tell you a little bit about also then those first machines because... Um, so, uh, Arbuckles are interesting. Um, Arbuckle goes into business in, uh, 1861, really gets into coffee in, in, uh, starts its places in, um, Pennsylvania and then, uh, expands quite rapidly, get particularly into New York. And, um, what he's using is, uh, a coffee roaster, uh, which is uh, one that many of your listeners may have seen a picture of, which is the so-called Carter pulley mm -hmm. uh, roasting system. And this is the one where you kind of sort of put the whole lot inside a brick kiln, and then it's kind of like a big long tube, which obviously then it just kind of revolved in the in thing. You then pull out through pulleys this big uh, sort of tube, turn it on its side, so you you then pretty much empty it onto the floor you know, the coffee is then sort of, you know, doused in water. So you have steam everywhere. So there's some great descriptions or, you know, it must've been chaos, basically, these sort of coffee plants. And mm -hmm. they, what Arbuckles was doing was putting these in a row. So uh, the famous illustration uh, shows, you know, like a whole sets of rows of these tubes uh, being pulled in and out. You can, you know, it looks like it almost, I mean, I don't want to say hell because that's, that, that's not really quite the right <laughs> way. But I mean, it looks like the kind of place which would be very, very smoky, very difficult to see what you were doing. You I were supposed that. to gauge whether the burns, whether the beans were done, not by looking at the beans, but by the kind of the smoke that was beginning to come out of the kiln. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's, um, it's, it, you know, it, it, that's sort of kind of early scene. Follow then uh, the famous name of Jabez Burns um, and uh, Uka's, he's, you know, the, the, uh, the, the go-to man on, on coffee always thinks that, uh, you know, says that Jabez Burns is um, roasters, uh, which were effectively ones where you could self um, self unload them. In other words, that you could kind of discharge from the front of the roaster into a cooling tray, that these were the big breakthrough because the Burns things were much more, uh, they were much more user friendly for for want of a better word. They were, and also because of the way that they were set, they were much quicker filled and unfilled. So you could mm. actually roast more quickly and effectively on those. So sort of Burns' great contribution is to do that. I see. Um, that's our sort of late nineteenth century. And the other thing to say about that, of course, is that um, Arbuckles in particular are glazing their beans. So what they're doing, lots of sort of tips throughout the 19th century is to how do you get the grounds to settle in your coffee? Yeah. So you, you, because if you make your coffee in the way that most people were, which was sort of basically, you know, just boiling the water direct with the coffee mm -hmm. or even, uh, you know, some kind of immersion thing in a, in a punch pot, you would basically the problem is how do you get the grounds to the bottom? How do you make the coffee? You know, how do you separate the coffee from the ground? Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of the pet tricks for that is to use egg. Um, the other is to use isinglass, which is a sort of a, you know, a fish product. But um, mm. egg was one of the things that was, was seen to be uh, effective. So actually, um, Arbuckles were glazing their coffee with egg. With egg. And 
You're well, with kind of an egg, yeah, um, kind of not pure egg, but with some kind of glaze, which which contains sort of that kind of um, product. We we are talking about like eggs from a chicken, right? We're talking about eggs from a chicken, <laughs> and um, you know, we we don't entirely know. Of course, all of these things are sort of you know protected, but that the idea was that this glaze would therefore help you settle the grounds, and also quote it would you know stop. And this sounds very weird to anybody who's uh, go back to our conversation about specialty you freak when you hear this, but it was like, you know, to stop the pores of the coffee beans, uh, basically, um, from extracting, sort of being right? exposed. yeah, exactly. Or from degassing for that matter. <laughs> um, so you, you're, you know, it, well, let's say it would have tasted pretty weird, but we know that glazing in various forms goes on for a long time. And it goes back to that point I was making about tasting the roast. Yeah, that in many mm-hmm. ways, these first industrial products are about tasting the roast and it's the roast that tastes, uh, that is the, t- the taste that you get rather than really, so, you know, you have a generic coffee taste, but you distinguish one from another by right. the roast taste. Um, and that obviously disguises a multiple, multiplicity of faults really in the coffee itself. Um, yeah. That's... So you can, you know, you're used, you can use basic commodity coffee because that's not actually, in a sense, the taste you're ultimately selling. The roast is the taste. You're right, because it's being masked by, like, egg. Yeah, exactly. It's being masked <laughs> by all kinds of things. But, but, I yeah. mean, that goes on for a long time. So if you think about one of the things, just to, to kind of be a little bit more global here, so if you think about um, Spanish coffee, torrefacto. Yeah. Same principle. But you're kind of glazing with a bit of honey and bits right. of sugar and so forth. Or chicory so coffee or things like Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're developing those distinctive tastes at the point of production rather than at the point of uh, cultivation and through the roast taste rather than the bringing out of the flavor of the bean. So, yeah, there's a lot changing over history. It's not just the way that you're roasting. It's the philosophy behind the coffee itself. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And, and the philosophy of, you know, what are people going to what are people drinking? What are they perceiving right. as, as the end product? Yeah. Next point would be probably to say that the first half of the 20th century or really the mid, you know, through to the mid 20th century, this is when most of uh, the bigger roasters emerge, um, certainly in Europe as well as, as the States. So, I mean, the States sees various moments. I would just say, you know, you get the whole sort of thing with the seal, with the canning. So uh, Chase and mm-hmm. Sanborn seal coffee is the sort of the first real canned coffee in the sense that they're putting it in a can and sealing it. And then um, we get hills who are actually kind of doing the first kind of vacuum packing of those cans. In Europe, what interests me is that so many of the big businesses that we know today, Lavazza, Julius Minehill, um, Paulig, uh, so that's, you know, Lavazza of Italy, Meinl in Austria, Paulig in Finland. They all start really as kind of grocery plus businesses in the late 19th century. Okay. Uh, and you, they go through these stages of having been quite often usually a grocery with a bit of coffee roasting to selling coffee as a primary product to other groceries to becoming places that sell their own branded coffee Mm. um so we see that kind of you know it's a gradual switch and again that relates a lot to the kind of technology that we see um the big roaster i suppose big roasting firm in europe is uh probat right Um, they're having their 150th birthday this year so they are that's absolutely right although their original name uh when they're when Probat, or they're people who, who, who started uh, Probat, they start by developing basically what we would call shop roasters, yeah? So things right. that you would roast within your shop for your customers primarily or mm-hmm. to sort of already have ready roasted coffee to give your customers. Gradually, the capacity of those things gets bigger. We see the development of the ball roaster, and mm-hmm. it begins to become possible as we also have the development, and this is the thing of the market, the urban market, to make your living out of roasting coffee and from that point you're first of all you're supplying still unbranded but roasted coffee to local groceries right then you begin to brand it yeah right it begins to be by roaster or so forth so somewhere like minel 
Uh, so I think Julius Meinl sets up in um, the Austrian Empire in the latter 19th century, and I think they sort of start roasting as a business in about the 1890s, and by the 1920s, they're just like huge. Right. You know, sort of dominant roaster across the whole of the Austrian Empire. That's amazing. Uh, and it's a sort of a, a similar but much later process in Italy. So, you know, um, the original uh, Mr. Lavazza opens his business in Turin, and it, it's uh, basically a grocery store again around the 1890s. Uh, and, you know, the family f- becomes a sort of a, a family firm, but it, it really takes off in the 1960s when they basically start using the advent of television and so forth to, and indeed just the advent of communications, to begin building a presence for their coffee around the country. Until that point, pretty much everywhere is a kind of a region, you know, at best a regional coffee roaster. I see. So, so the sort of marketing really brought people's eyes towards, in this case, exactly. Lavazza's brand. Interesting. Yeah, I, exactly so. Yeah, and creates, I mean, across the these territories, kind of almost little bits of taste that become sort of, part of you know what does italian coffee taste like what does german coffee taste like what does scandinavian coffee taste like becomes kind of a bit reified in this era if you see what i mean in other words it becomes instituted i see that this is that these are the ways that coffee tastes i see because you know in in a cafe setting you might have somebody come in say i like an italian espresso and you know these things have to be defined over time and like you like you just said like that's kind of how it happened over time yeah actually the other way around it's people come in saying i want a coffee and what do they mean by that coffee ah becomes differentiated yeah yeah you don't go into you know you get you go into your local cafe or whatever and just say i want a coffee well what's the coffee that you get increasingly that coffee becomes a particular flavor and again when that becomes more and more marketed to home and again the home market takes off uh post the 1950s really i would say in in europe in particular then you know, the big roasters are able to almost play on that to ensure their position. You know, our coffee becomes the representative of what German coffee tastes like, what Scandic coffee tastes like. Ah, exactly. uh, I see. You with me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Because now I'm going to throw you again and say, of course, that there's another change there. <laughs> because era four in my sort of theory is um the era when we kind of go global but we go global with a very specific driver and that's the driver of the advent of robusta as uh, a key part of the market Mm. and robusta comes in really okay we know robusta is sort of planted from the end of the 19th century but really it becomes critical around that immediate post sort of about the 50s really and a lot of um that Robusta finds its way particularly into certain blends. So um, France, for example, would be be a a good example of a place where, you know, Robusta became really very dominant Hmm. uh, because a lot of it comes from those uh, countries that have been uh, under French uh, rule um, and become independent and develop their coffee industries as a way of of, um, developing their economies. So uh, Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire would be a good example so of course to roast that kind of you know robusta coffee again you roast pretty dark yeah because we know that roasting robusta coffee higher and darker creates those sort of effects of uh, caramelization Mm. that make that more palatable particularly at a commodity level Uh so again we kind of begin to change a little bit what we're roasting and what and um uh, the flavors we're targeting in order to deal with the kind of coffee that's available you know, in a way, French roast becomes even more French roast at that point. Do you see yeah. what I mean? It, no, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I think that takes us up almost into the era of specialty roasting. And specialty roasting and the whole of the specialty movement, as you know, it is, I guess we would say it's a combination of premiumization and decommodification. And a key element of that is kind of the resurgence of the idea of artisan roasting, of roasting as we said, to sort of bring out the flavors of the beans, to roast in smaller batches, to be going back to the kinds of roasting that that industry doesn't do and the kind of roasting and products that industry doesn't do because otherwise there's no niche. 
because there's a huge mm-hmm. problem obviously if sort of a medium small to medium sized business if you're make if you're doing the same kind of coffee as everybody else then you're really not that you know there's nothing distinctive for you so mm-hmm. why would you survive right that last stage which we're still seeing develop and develop is a stage in which in a sense we kind of get much more into i think the theory of roasting much more into thinking about different beans different roast profiles uh about um doing the reverse of standardizing what one does and i guess you could say just to to make a little controversial we've got a diversity of things because we get the sort of you know the rise of people saying they're slow roasting and um smaller batches and then at the other extreme we've got you know the rise of the turnkey coffee factory uh with the air based you know air bed roaster mm-hmm. um you know pushing the the stuff through in three minutes so we kind of got almost a diversification a bigger and bigger diversification between um artisan style roasting and industrial mass industrial roasting yeah each each of these comments i feel is a whole conversation so i'm just there's, there's a whole chapter <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect good plug good yeah. plug I, uh, I was pleased with that. <laughs> so is is at this point, is this where we see the sort of, you know, the way I'm seeing this uh, micro roaster back in the home thing that's happening seems like, you know, that that's another stage of, of where uh, coffee is going. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point. I'm uh, I think that will happen. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the best thing to happen from the point of view of specialty, uh, because although in one sense, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit the way that I feel at the moment is, you know, part of the key of specialty is actually you're trusting your coffee to someone who's taking a lot of care and putting a lot of expertise in it. Mm-hmm. I'm unsure whether that will work for home roasting, particularly in the kinds of quantities that one might be looking at to do uh you know because of the the amount that you'd have to do to a learn how to do it to get your best results and b to drink what you generated but yes i think that is a possibility i think the 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 kind of trend that i see and which seems to me to have been in a way a little bit of the, the specialty trend is the return to shop roasting so, you know, you're kind of shop roasting the individual artists, you know, individual sort of shop roast and you're selling from the shop. So you're showing that whole roasting process to people. You're showing the the, um, the individuality of what you do. Uh, it's very exciting, I have to say. I mean, that's one of the first things that really excites me about um, coffee is, is seeing, you know, roast that you're talking to somebody who's roasted that, who can tell you about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. My sense is, for various reasons, not least uh, health and safety legislation, actually there seems to be more shop roasting at the moment in the States than there is in, uh, in Europe, certainly in the UK. We're tending to have more small roasteries supplying um, shops right, uh, and supplying sort of niche audiences than we are having actual sort of, you know, shop roasting. I see. But that does strike me that that is the way you know, I suspect things will go. But you're right in saying, yeah, we're seeing a shift away, aren't we, from, you know, we're seeing a shift back to thinking about roasting in many, many, in smaller and more bespoke ways, I guess. And in fact, I think bespoke is another good way of thinking about specialty coffee. So we, we've kind of walked from the beginning to current day, modern. Yep. Where is the coffee roaster been? Where is it gone? And and in that conversation, kind of just hearing through the details how philosophy of roastings changed over time. It's yeah. wildly interesting to me. I have some additional questions here sure. that I'd love to ask you. You know, we've we've seen the second wave of coffee globalize in recent history. Do you think mm-hmm. the third wave will globalize in the same way? Yes. Uh, I would say that there a few elements to it. First of all, I think it is already globalizing because we have actually a global society at some levels. Okay. So if you think about what's going on uh, in in like, you know, at 
parts of say it's like Serling in South Korea or uh, Singapore or whatever, you can find fantastic third wave coffee shops there. That in one hand is brilliant. Uh, and on the other hand, you could say that the third wave coffee shop in Singapore doesn't look that different from the third wave coffee shop in New York. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, because actually we're really talking about our high quality coffee. So there's an interesting trade-off between we're going to see, I think, third wave coffee uh, spreading, but actually some of the things that we really like about third wave coffee, its diversity and so forth, we're going to have to think hard about how we reflect that right? Uh, as, as we see that globalization. Uh, second thing that I think is actually very important and actually is what I think is going to drive the next era of coffee for most of that history from once we got away from the Islamic phase, the first phase, we were talking about coffee being grown in one place and drunk in another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that whole long value chain and so forth. Now what's really changing things is producer countries consuming their own coffee. And that really is beginning to happen. And I mean, nowhere is clearer than that in than Brazil. You know, Brazil is not uh -huh. only the producer of coffee, it's the second biggest consumer of coffee. Um, so I think that is what will be market transforming. Now, that will take a while to build to, um, I think, you know, th those tr transformations will work through the wave themselves. Coffee becomes a mass taste. Coffee becomes a coffee shop experience. And they, both of those are already there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little bit of specialty coffee on the top of that. And it also creates a lot of issues because actually, again, then it becomes very interesting. You know, is your specialty coffee purely your own coffee? Or are you, you know, there are places that are doing specialty in, say, Indonesia, but they're bringing in coffee from, I don't know, Panama. So it's right. kind of an, you know, we've, we're seeing lots of interesting developments there. But do I think it will globalize? Undoubtedly, because we are a much more global uh, world. And actually, coffee people, uh, if I can make so bold, strike me as very international people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're interested in, in international trends, we're interested in the way that we interact with each other. Um, and that's sort of driving some, you know, drive, drive some great things, I think, uh, you know, both at the level of, of coffee and coffee culture and also at the level of a kind of a more general uh, understanding and respect. Excellent. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining us on the show to talk about roasting uh, and to dive You're a little deeper well. into the uh, topics around it. So uh, our listeners love resources um, and I know that you are releasing this new book. Can you tell us a little more about it? And uh, let's let's get a better picture of uh, why our, our listeners might want to read your book. Hey, your listeners absolutely should read my book. <laughs> um, so don't even go there. Um, yeah, okay. So listen, the, the book uh, is going to be called Coffee, A Global History. It's going to be published by Reaction Press. It will be available to order, I think, fairly soon, and it will come out in November. So just in time for Christmas. But if you want to access a lot of my work, so, you know, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I think I've given you, Jesse, uh, my website, but if anyone mm -hmm. just puts the words Jonathan Morris and coffee into a search engine of their choice, they're pretty likely to end up there. And um, there I've got a lot of resources already including some vouchers for getting, as I said, at discount, the Coffee, the Comprehensive Guide to the Bean Beverage in the Industry, whether you're from um, Europe or the US uh, or, or wherever. So uh, please come have a look at my site as well. Well, we hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as we did. You can find a link to Professor Morris's books in the episode bio notes and also on our website at thecoffeepodcast.org. Just remember, if you ever have a bad cup of coffee, it's never as bad as a cup of coffee made of grounds that are soaked in egg. <laughs> the Coffee Podcast is produced by me, Jesse Hartman. Music is by Michael Parallax. You can find his music at michaelparallax.com. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, happy brewing.